This is the CBS Evening News. Bob Schieffer reporting. Good evening. White House officials said tonight they expect both President Reagan and Vice President Bush to fight any attempt to force them to testify in Oliver North's Iran-Contra trial. North's lawyer issued subpoenas yesterday for both to testify and disclosed today that more subpoenas are on the way. White House correspondent Bill Plant is with the president in California and has today's developments. Oliver North's lawyer denies he's trying to pressure the Reagan White House into dropping charges or pardoning his client. But he did suggest that he will be calling even more prominent witnesses. There'll be further subpoenas Are you as, the, as the weeks proceed. Can you say names? Poindexter, N McFarland? No, I, I cannot, but they'd be the obvious ones that uh, are involved in this matter. President Reagan, vacationing in California, shot what he calls his annual round of golf today. And administration officials said they would fight any attempt to force Mr. Reagan to appear in court. But North's trial is not scheduled to begin until after George Bush takes office. And a constitutional scholar says that while North may want the drama of cross-examining a president in open court, the principle of immunity for a chief executive is well established. It's very hard to see how um, Oliver North can make a plausible case that George Bush is needed uh, to testify in this trial. But ex-president Reagan could be a different matter. The most important witness for North may well be not George Bush, but Ronald Reagan. And I think it's very important to realize that when he rides off into the sunset, he does not carry the Oval Office with him. Nevertheless, Mr. Reagan's attorneys are expected to argue that he should not be forced to appear on grounds of executive privilege and national security. Officials say the president sees the subpoena as part of a pressure campaign to get him to pardon North a campaign which they expect to grow in intensity during the last weeks of the Reagan administration. But despite the heat, these sources predict that there is no way Ronald Reagan will pardon Oliver North. Bill Plant, CBS News, with the president in Palm Springs. It's a time of year, of course, when it is traditional to reflect on the progress we've made, and that's what President Reagan and Soviet leader Gorbachev did today in an exchange of videotaped New Year's messages. Linda Tyro. On behalf of the American people... President Reagan, in a high-tech New Year's greeting card to the Soviet Union, expressed optimism about continuing progress in U.S.-Soviet relations. But I am confident that we have been witness in 1988 to progress that, if we're careful and diligent, can continue next year and during the years to come. In his message to the United States, Mikhail Gorbachev spoke of a new era between the superpowers. If we are capable of a new way of feeling, then we must surely be capable of a new way of thinking. Both leaders also talked of the suffering in earthquake-devastated Soviet Armenia. You have our deepest sympathy. You have our prayers. We are grateful to the American people and to all peoples who have come to our aid. The practice of exchanging greetings has followed the ups and downs in superpower relations. It began in 1985, after President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev broke the ice in Geneva. Only in 1986, in the wake of the chilly Iceland summit, did the exchange fail to materialize. For President Reagan, the improvement in U.S.-Soviet relations represents his biggest achievement in foreign policy, a legacy he leaves to George Bush. Both Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev say they expect the president-elect to continue the course. Linda Tyra, CBS News, with the president in Palm Springs. Soviet citizens are already celebrating the arrival of 1989. The movement of the clock in Red Square told the people of Moscow that the new year had indeed begun. Just moments earlier, Mikhail Gorbachev delivered a televised New Year's address to the Soviet people. Despite the economic policy changes of 1988, he said there are still shortages of consumer goods. Bert Quint reports from Moscow. The Russians don't recognize Santa Claus, but they do honor a New Year's figure called Grandfather Frost, and they gather around something they call the New Year's tree. So youngsters in this country will be getting their presents tomorrow morning. But for the grown-ups of the Soviet Union, despite the jingle bells of perestroika, it's just the end of one tough year, the beginning of another. 1988 ended with promise in the air, but as usual, little in the shops. Despite the hullabaloo about restructuring the economy, the lines are as long as ever, the prospect of material progress as dim. 
shortages are still so much a way of life that in some areas, meat is being rationed and the sale of butter limited. In a New Year address, just before midnight in Moscow, Mikhail Gorbachev admitted changes aren't coming as fast as we would all like them to. We have to do a great deal next year, he said, and he vowed it will be done. Alexander Yakovlev, Gorbachev's expert on perestroika, is even more blunt. He says economic reform is just spinning its wheels. So reform has a desperately long way to go, and Soviet leaders fear that if they don't bring concrete improvements in the next couple of years, there will be a vengeful backlash from conservatives and disgruntled consumers. What's important here is not that a new year is beginning, but that another year has ended with those economic wheels still spinning. For perestroika, time may be running out. Bert Quint, CBS News, Moscow. The Chicago Bears beat the Philadelphia Eagles 20 to 12 today to advance to the National Football League Conference Finals, but unless they heard it on the radio, a lot of the people who went to the game may not know all that. Gary Reeves has our report. As Chicago and Philadelphia's football teams squared off for their crucial playoff battle, a blinding fog descended on Soldier Field in the middle of the game, obscuring the view with a thick, hazy cloud. Any possibility of a view from the press box, our normal game coverage, is impossible. The announcers could not see the playing field, but apparently the players could see each other, so the game went on. For fans in the stands, the game was invisible. We know we're winning, but who are we playing now? It's, it's impossible to see, even from here. You can't even see the screen on the TV. Many wanted the game postponed until visibility improved. Even those with the best view complained. It definitely was uh, a factor in the game. The, uh, the quarterbacks probably couldn't see well enough to throw the ball downfield, and so it did become uh, you know, a quick passing route type of uh, affair late in the game. But the players were able to see about half the field, and officials ruled that was good enough. As long as I could see and the officials could see both goalposts, why we felt the game was uh, playable, and, and we kept it in that condition all the time. The fans came not only to watch the game, but also to watch Eagles coach Buddy Ryan continue his running feud with former boss Bears coach Mike Ditka but they couldn't even see each other. Sometimes I couldn't see the other side of the field, but they had the same problems on their side, I'm sure. In spite of the fog, the Bears pulled off a win, proving again it's tough to beat the team with the home fog advantage. Yari Reed, CBS News, Chicago. Well, coming up next on tonight's CBS Evening News, the North American knothole war. And later, Bruce Morton will report on the lifestyles of the fleeting fans. new free trade agreement between the United States and Canada takes effect, but a knotty dispute remains to be resolved in one industry that is important on both sides of the border. David Dow has the story. Stripped to essentials, it is a spat over knot holes, the size of knot holes in sheets of plywood. If that sounds frivolous, consider this. The knot hole dispute involves millions of dollars in potential exports and poses a barrier to international harmony as the U.S. and Canada launch a historic free trade agreement. Free trade is a fine phrase, but uh, it's one that, that we can support, but we can support it only if it's fair trade. Both the U.S. and Canada have major plywood industries, but much of the U.S. product is banned by Canadian building standards, which don't allow the larger knot hole sizes typically found in American plywood. U.S. producers contend the Canadian codes have nothing to do with quality. They are simply non-tariff protective barriers. They have, in effect, blocked us from a free trade with a product that we think is uh, a large part of our, of our industry. In Vancouver, Canadian officials insist their plywood standards are no joke. They've been used to cultivate an international market for plywood that they say benefits both countries. The Canadians say that dropping their standards would send a wrong signal abroad. As the plywood industry faces increasing competition, we feel it is even more important that we maintain our stance. Under the new free trade agreement, virtually all tariffs are to be phased out, including the 20% tax the U.S. assesses Canadian plywood and the 15% Canadian tax on U.S. plywood. But the U.S. refuses to drop its tariffs until Canada changes its building codes. We do not want to see any lessening of the standards uh, for, for our product, and we're going to fight damned hard 
uh, to ensure that doesn't happen. If neither side gives up the knothole war, the two nations may, sooner than expected, get to test a key provision of their new trade agreement, one calling for a special board to resolve disputes. David Dow, CBS News, Los Angeles. New Year's Day also brings the opening shots of a trade war between the United States and the European common market. Europe is banning American meat treated with growth hormones, and the U.S. plans to retaliate with heavy duties on European food products. Well, this is the night that ordinary citizens can become some of the most dangerous people in America. They drink too much at parties and try to drive home. But the New Year is bringing tough new crackdowns on drunk drivers, and Jonathan Sanders reports. New Year's Eve traditionally brings out some of America's deadliest terrorists, drunk drivers. The equivalent of a fully loaded 747 crashing every week for a year equals the number of people killed in alcohol-related crashes each year. Last year, 23,632 people died as a result of drunk driving, and more than half a million were injured. But there are signs that aggressive police enforcement and harsher penalties part of the largest ever campaign against drunk driving may finally be paying off. The death and injury rate due to alcohol-related crashes is significantly lower uh, in the past eight years since Mothers Against Drunk Driving has been involved. But obviously it's not enough. You haven't been drinking tonight? No, I haven't. That's one reason drivers will face tougher laws in many states with the beginning of the new year. In California, drunk drivers can now be billed when the highway patrol responds to accidents they cause. In New Jersey, it means bringing out an extra thousand troopers for the holiday. We're out there to enforce the law. If you break the law in your court, you're going to be punished. And they're getting help, too. Citizens groups and businesses are pitching in through public awareness campaigns. For Sherry, because of a drunk driver, family reunions will never be the same. All this still didn't prevent the death of this father's son, killed this week in a head-on collision with a drunk driver who wasn't hurt in the accident. If they knew that the police were right on the, around the corner, I think they would think twice about uh, overindulging in, the, in alcohol. And despite the improvement in the statistics, this week's Detroit victim was only one of approximately 66 people still killed by drunk drivers on an average day. And New Year's remains one of the booziest and deadliest holidays of the year. Jonathan Sanders, CBS News, New York. Convenes next week, most of the attention will be on the new faces. But in our Washington notebook tonight, we're focusing on one of the people who won't be there. A quiet man from Vermont. No, Larry. Uh, Larry, I might like to keep that. No, okay. They're packing boxes in the offices of Vermont Senator Robert Stafford after 28 years in both the House and Senate. He's finally calling it quits. Nearly three decades of history going into storage. Even after 28 years, he never really became a household name, and that was fine by him. He preferred to do the job without a lot of fuss. I like his Yankee personality and mannerisms. Low key, low profile. What you see is what you get with Bob Stafford. Some patience and uh, listening to my colleagues, many of whom like to have uh, some histrionic impact on what they were doing, and avoiding uh, partisan politics as much as I could seemed to be the best way for me to work. Stafford worked hardest on cleaning up the environment, Superfund legislation to restore contaminated waste sites, the Safe Drinking Water Act. The Clean Air Act. I would say that water and air are clean, much cleaner than they would have been if we hadn't put out the effort we have over the last 10 to 15 or 20 years. He found himself locking horns with the country's top Republican as he fought for environmental cleanup. He just said no. And when a Vermonter says no, he means no. A hero is someone who risks himself to bring enhanced light to others. And that's what Bob Stafford is. Stafford's other great passion was education. Again, he found himself opposing his president in pressing for funds to bring handicapped education into the mainstream, or extra money to educate the poor, for tuition credit to help college students, and he stopped the drive to eliminate the Department of Education. I'm glad that Stafford's point of view prevailed. 
and the, and the mind did not prevail in, in that regard. Stafford credits his doggedness to his Vermont roots. It's a pretty little state, he says. We don't like a lot of turmoil. We just get things done. After three decades, Stafford can show he'd lived those words. And to the cynics who complain that nothing good ever comes out of Washington, Stafford has a different view. I think the system works. Uh, uh, the state governments work maybe better than the federal government, but the federal government works too. And uh, even the Senate, which sometimes reminds me of the bumblebee, technically it probably shouldn't be able to fly, but in spite of the frustrations of late night sessions and filibusters and everything else, it eventually seems to get the work done. The finer things in life. Address, President Reagan vowed today to seek out the truth and punish the guilty in the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. Searchers around Lockerbie, Scotland today recovered one part of the jumbo jet that clearly showed emergency lights were still on 10 days after the plane was down. It was on a New Year's Eve that Cuba's Fidel Castro won the revolution that brought him to power. That was 30 years ago. For nearly three times that long, though, the U.S. Navy has had a foothold right on Castro's doorstep, and it has no plans to pull out anytime soon. Tonight, Ron Allen has more on that. The only American military base on communist soil is also the Navy's primary training facility for the Atlantic Fleet. At Guantanamo Bay, crewmen prepare for the rigors of the sea, while Marines maintain watch at the fence line with Cuba. We don't have a threatening offensive force or capability here in Guantanamo Bay. We clearly are a support station, a training station, a schoolhouse station. For example, Navy jets fly mock air raids at the ships offshore. Disasters are simulated. In this damage control exercise, fire has broken out in the main engine compartment. Water is rushing into the ship. This is just a drill, but the real thing happened aboard the same type of ships in the Persian Gulf, when the USS Stark was hit by a missile, and when the Samuel V. Roberts struck a mine. Both ships' crews had recently been trained by Guantanamo Bay's instructors. Lives were saved for what they learned here and how they continued the training once they left here. I think Guantanamo Bay is right in being proud of what they contributed to that. But some analysts believe the same training could have been accomplished at another base, and that the overriding reason the United States has maintained this base on communist Cuba is political. For the last 30 years, Castro has been, at the very best, a huge pain in the neck, and at the very worst, an outright adversary. It must frustrate him enormously that here the principal adversary of the United States maintains a toehold in Cuba and has kept, kept onto that toehold. The possible closing of this base was discussed during the Carter administration, but Guantanamo Bay's future seems secure now. Not because of its strategic location close to Central America, but because the Navy sees this base as the perfect location to train its Atlantic fleet. The Navy has been using Guantanamo more than 80 years under the terms of an open-ended lease agreement signed when relations with Cuba were much different. And the Cubans cannot end this unlikely landlord-tenant relationship without U.S. consent. Ron Allen, CBS News, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Seems the right time to ask, whatever happened to all those people and all those things we spent so much time talking about in 1988? Well, sure enough, Bruce Morton is ready to talk about just that. Where are they now? The America's Cup is living quietly in San Diego. New Zealand challenged using a bigger boat than the old rules allowed. America countered with more holes than the old rules allowed, and the catamaran won easily. John Poindexter, no longer an admiral, grew a mustache and prepared his defense. Oliver North, perhaps the handsomest of the Iran-Contra figures, campaigned for some congressional candidates, was a well-paid hit on the lecture circuit. His trial is due to start next month. A lot of people called me up after the hearings and they said, would you ever consider doing broadcasting or anchoring it? Fawn Hall, probably the prettiest witness of the hearings, made her TV debut on Our Magazine. But relax, Bob, she's writing a book instead of anchor-seeking. 
The United States, with help from a Soviet icebreaker, freed two whales trapped way up in the Bering Strait so they could migrate south. A lot of well-meaning rescuers trying to do the same thing for a dolphin, which wouldn't leave a small bay off Virginia Beach, failed. They plan another try next month. Fourteen men ran for president in a year of negative campaigning. Michael Dukakis got to run as long as any, but ended up back in the Massachusetts State House. George Bush landed the big prize. Willie Horton, perhaps the year's leading campaign issue, is in prison in Jessup, Maryland. He couldn't vote. Please forgive me for sinning against you. TV evangelist Jimmy Swaggart confessed unnamed sin with a prostitute, but by the end of the year he was preaching again on TV again. Jim and Tammy Baker were preaching in a roller rink. The Washington Redskins, who won the 1988 Super Bowl, are watching the playoffs at home and had their first losing season since 1980. The UN peacekeeping forces won the Nobel Peace Prize, but William Higgins, an American serving with them, was kidnapped. He and eight other American hostages remain unfree. But I had no other course of action. The U.S. cruiser Vincennes, which mistakenly shot down an Iranian passenger plane, came home to San Diego. Captain Will Rogers still in command. She'll go to sea again next year. Douglas Ginsburg, who did not become a Supreme Court justice, still serves as a judge on the Federal Appeals Court here. Robert Bork, who did not become a justice either, writes and lectures for a Washington think tank. The American manned space program went back into business. Two shuttles took off safely. And stones flew and guns sounded in the Israeli-occupied West Bank and Gaza. This Palestinian, Nasser Hawash, later died of his wounds. But he and others lit a troubled flame, the Intifada, which will burn in 1989. Bruce Morton, CBS News. And that's the news. Charles Corralt will be here first thing Sunday morning, and later tonight, West 57th, will have an interview with jazz great Wynton Marsala. I'm Bob Schieffer, CBS News, New York. Good night and a happy new year. They rammed L.A. Now the Vikings are out to topple Mighty Joe and the Niners. An NFC playoff battle tomorrow on CBS Sports. This is CBS. Hooray.